Words at War. Oh, Sedgwick. Dave Sedgwick. Yes, boss. What have I done now? Step in my office. All right. Well, you've done nothing except... Well, congratulations on that Fanatelli killing story. It was good. Gosh. Tell me, Dave. How'd you like to cover the biggest murder story of the year? Oh, brother, that's for me. Okay, get packed. You're leaving for England to cover the war for the globe. Leaving... Now, don't start yapping thank yous at me. Listen to me. We're caught short. Wang Lee got hurt in a plane crash. We need a man we can trust over there. And don't let it go to your head. You cover a story over there the same as you do here. Just remember to be above it, beyond it, impersonal and impartial. <laughs> I catch. Just a guy holding a mirror up to light. All right, cut the smart stuff. Tell me, want the job? If the British don't object, why should I? That's the beginning of tonight's Words at War, as the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime, presents an adaptation of Robert St. John's new novel, It's Always Tomorrow, a hard-hitting book about the men and women of bomb-battered England. His lordship will be going to the country tonight, but uh, he wishes to retain his suite. Very well, sir. The name's Sedgwick, David Sedgwick. I've got a room reserved uh, here. Sedgwick? Yes? Uh, David Sedgwick? Uh-huh. Oh, come along, then. I have your keys, old boy. Well, uh, who are you? Oh, Dick Matthews, old boy. Over here five years now, you know, for the Globe, and waiting here to show you around. Uh, thanks. As I said, Rick, has anyone ever told you you bear a remarkable resemblance to Gary Grant? You don't look so bad yourself, Dickie boy. <laughs> oh, now look here. Now, take it easy, kid. It's that English accent. It kind of gets me down. Now, suppose you tell me how I get started around here. Well, uh, first of all, you've got to get your ration books. Then you'll need passes to get you by the armed guards at the Ministry of Information. Uh-huh. The War Office in Whitehall, uh, BBC and other government offices. Uh, then you'll have to register as an alien. As and... an alien? Why, yes, yes, of course, you're an alien here, you know. Uh, then I'll introduce you to my tobacconist and try to get him to put you on his list for cigarettes. Okay, okay, that's fine. But when do I get down to business? When do I meet Churchill? Oh, you don't, old boy. But there's a cocktail party tomorrow at Claridge's where you can meet some of the important people in the foreign office. Uh, good contact, you know. Uh, good contact. Okay, I'll be there. I said, uh, uh, two pink gin. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, tell me, Sedgwick, mm-hmm. what did you people think of the Prime Minister's statement that he doesn't intend to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire, huh? Not very much. <laughs> Excellent. That's the kind of talk I like, straight from the shoulder, huh? Mr. Thornsby, what do you people think of the American ambassador? Well, frankly, old man, it's too bad they sent him. It's the wrong kind of chap, you know. Matter of fact, I'm quite disturbed, you show, but the, uh, WWW menace. The WWW? Yes, yes. Wynant, Wallace, and Wells. Those fellows really are a menace, you know, with their claptrap of brave new worlds and remaking the universe. Socialism, that's what it is. You don't say. Oh, most emphatically. They talk of throwing open the colonies, our colonies. It's impertinence, my boy. Britain's been generous and kind to the natives in our colonies. How would Africa or India or even America ever have been developed if it hadn't been for the British? We've used our skill and sunk our money into those obscure places to make them produce. Why should we turn them over to backward nations? Uh, two pink gins, sir. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, here you are, Sedgwick. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm feeling a little sick. Oh, uh, had one too many, eh, old chap? That's right, one too many. Excuse me, please. Right oh, cheerio. Stupid lot of toffs, aren't they, Janie? No worse than the usual. No, I'm not kidding, baby. They take the cake, every one of them. Excuse me, sir? I said I agree with you. They're not only stupid, but the worst bunch of stuffed shirts I've ever... I beg your pardon, sir. Was it another pink gin you was wanting, sir? Listen, beautiful, you're the only person I've met here today who's made any sense. Right. One gin it is. What's your name, honey? Here you are, sir. Look, beautiful, I'm a strange guy in a strange country, and nobody speaks my language except you, and even you sound a little funny. Will there be anything else, sir? Yes, there is. How about having dinner with me tonight? Sir? Swell, it's a date. I'll meet you in the Piccadilly lobby at seven. Okay, Yank. Okay. What's your name, honey? Polly. Polly what? Just Polly. 
What's yours? Dave Sedgwick. Dave, do you? Have you ever been to Hollywood, Dave? Oh, no. I come from Chicago. Chicago? Mm-hmm. I never heard of it. <laughs> Really, David, you know, you look just like someone I've seen in the flicks ever so many times. The flicks? Yeah, you know, flicks, cinema, the, the movies. <laughs> now, don't tell me it was Cary Grant. No, isn't he the stuck-up one, though? <laughs> Polly, you're priceless. What are you doing in England, David? I'm covering the war for a newspaper, and I think you people are terrific. I mean, the job you've been doing. Yes. And I think we've been taken in. You've been... What do you mean, Polly? I mean, I think we're a pack of fools for fighting the bloody war. That's what. I beg your pardon, sir. Would, would you and your friend mind moving to another table, sir? What's that, waiter? No need to ask him, David. Look around you. Can't you see that all the lords and their ladies have left the vicinity of our table? But why? Because they've spotted me for what I am. A waitress. They think I'm not good enough to be eating in the dining room with the Savoy along with the likes of them. Oh, you're kidding. Am I? Now do you understand why I don't care who wins the blooming blasted war? Cedric, well, I got my ration book and passes. Anything terrific happened today? Oh, just the usual communique on the fighting on last night's air raid. No statement from cabinet members and nothing from Parliament. Typical day. What's the matter with you, Richard? You you look as though you just lost your last two bucks on the race. David, mm -hmm. I overheard some talk over at the Ministry of Information this morning. Oh, yeah? What about? You? Oh. Yes, they were talking about some girl who took to dinner at the Savoy last night. Said she was a waitress. What about it? Well, uh, <laughs> now, look here, old boy. I've been over here several years, and you can't find the face of convention like that or... Or what? Well, you see, Sedgwick, England is a country with an upper and lower class. Nothing you can do will change it. Taking that poor go uh, girl to the Savoy was the same as... Well, as if you had walked into the dining room of the Waldorf Astoria in New York, leading a horse. Whose side are you on, Matthews? Mine or theirs? The trouble with you is you've been here too long, traveling with a lot of stuffed shirts. Now, look here, old boy. No, I'm you lit. look here, old boy. You tell your pals to stay away from the Dorchester tonight because Dave Sedgwick and his lower-class girlfriend are going to be there. And tell them I said if they don't like it, they can lump it. Well, Polly... How do you like dining with the toughs for the second night in a row? Oh, I can stand it. Oh. You know, Polly, I'm still hungry. <laughs> Serves you right for dining in such an expensive place. <laughs> all in all, though, I, I think the dollar limit per meal law is okay. It's okay for those that obey the law. Hmm? Look around you, David. Do these people look hungry? Well... Do you want to know how they get around the five-shilling limit per meal? Yeah, very much. Say that you and me are the likes of them... We come here to the Dorchester and have some smoked salmon. We order five shillings worth and then go around to Claridge's and have a bit of joint and vegetables. Another five bob's worth. We just keep going from one place to the other. So you see, Dave, if you've got the pounds and shillings to eat out for six days of the week, on Sunday you can spend your whole week's ration tickets for one grand meal, while the rest of the people has to string theirs out for the whole seven days. So that's what happens. Oh, I hate him. I hate this war, which is being fought to save them and their precious skins. You're wrong, Polly. This war isn't being fought to preserve people like them. Oh? It's being fought for democracy, I suppose. Yes. Well, my father lost his leg for democracy last time. And what did it get him? The privilege of stumping around on a wooden leg and selling violets to the rich. Polly, if you feel that way, why do you wait on those people at Claridge's? Because I don't want to get drafted into the Wrens or the ATS or a munitions factory. I'm not helping their blasted war along. Not me. Polly, I, I don't get it. Look, you, if you... you work for a hotel, no matter what your job is, it's called a reserved occupation, and they can't draft you. Nothing's too good for the rich, you know. You're bitter, Polly. You're bitter and prejudiced. Don't you realize what's at stake? Don't you know that the rich and poor in England are all in the same boat? Do you want to take a chance on the Nazis winning the war? What difference does it make who wins the blasted war? The Jerrys won't scrounge me any worse than my betters have been doing up to now. Let the Germans win. Let Look, them win. Look, Polly, I'm sick of taking news handouts from government officials. Let's go out and ask the people themselves how they feel about it. What do you say? Okay, David. Waiter, the check. Mm 
The foreman said I could talk to you, may I? Hey, I think so. Half a mo. Now, how many hours a day do you work in this factory? At uh, twelve. How many days a week? Seven. But I hear we're going on six soon. Tell me, why... Why are you willing to, to work so hard? Willing? Hey, What's that? <laughs> are you balmy, chum? <laughs> I see. One more question. Don't you get awfully tired working 12 hours a day, seven days a week? Oh, I don't mind that. But the thing that plays me out is the four hours of air raid warden duty each night. <laughs> but after the war, I'll rest up. Have your head examined, you fool. You work, they play. Cabbages, the boys, greens, sprouts, broccoli. Yes, sir. Some nice greens, sir. No, I, I'd, I'd like a piece of fruit. Have you got any oranges? Oranges, sir? Block me. Last time I saw a orange, it was on exhibition in Regent Street, sir. That was five years ago. But we'll have them again, sir. I'll bet you will. Yeah, that's what we're fighting for, ain't it? What do you mean? Well, so all of us will have all the oranges we can eat, sir. Yeah, and we will too, right after the war. Fruits for them, but not for you, you fool. <laughs> the occupation, sir. Elsewife, you might say, sir. And how do you manage for food, Mrs. Thrumley? Well, sir, the rationing allows us each a shilling and tuppence worth of meat each week. About a pound, bone included. Why, that's 24 cents worth of meat a week, American money. How about things like butter and eggs? Mm, two ounces of butter a week and one to three eggs a month, depending on the season, sir. We'll manage, sir, so long as we have to. Oh, there'll be tubs of butter and... Tons of eggs for all of us after the war, sir. After the war, is it, Mrs. Trumley? You'll be back on the dole after the war. And how do you feel about the taxes, your lordship? Taxes? What does any man think about taxes? What father means is that he doesn't mind the taxes. Do you, father? What men of English blood would... When he sees what the dirty Hun has done to our people and our cities with his bombs and his V1s and V2s, thousands killed and mangled, one out of every three houses in Britain utterly destroyed or damaged. Yes, Mr. Sedgwick, I like to pay my taxes. Every penny's a bullet aimed at the heart of the enemy. Would you mind telling me for publication how much you paid last year, Your Lordship? Oh, about $975,000. Nine hundred. Gosh, you sure must have cleaned up. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Sedgwick, father only netted $24,000. There's a 97 and one-half percent tax, you know. That's right. My income was about $1 million your money. But what I'm giving to the war is nothing compared to what my son has sacrificed. Father. My son lost both eyes in North Africa. Well, I'm going to do my best to see that there's no recurrence of this after this war. Stop it, David, stop it. Do you think I'll believe the likes of him either? Oh, I'm tired of all this, David. I'm tired of your arguments, tired of your flag waving. You're shouting at me, picking at me, arguing at me. Polly, I proved you're wrong. You're twisted in your thinking. If all the people I've interviewed felt like you, England would have thrown in the sponge long ago. Sure, there's injustices in England, in America too. But do you honestly think you can wipe out those injustices of Hitler, Himmler, and that gang got the top hand? Do you? Polly, get into it and do your bit. Then afterwards, you will have the right, yes, the duty to see to it that the upper crust listens to you. Let them listen to me now. I say I don't want to live on hopes. I say let them eat the same as we eat. Make the same sacrifices we're making. Let them come out of the fancy restaurants and do their part. And then I'll march into the nearest war plant and get a job tomorrow. No, I'm tired. Come on, let's be off. Where to? The Savoy? Not in your life. There's something more me own style. The Elephant and Castle. Last week, down the Randy comes a cough. Nice old geezer with the nasty cough. Sees my missus, takes his top and off in a very gentle, manly way. Watch it. Street, Bill. Ah. No. <laughs> I thought I should have done.
Oh, it's the best. Well, if it ain't my old pen pal Polly, how are you, Nubby? Albert, as I live and breathe. Yeah. Well. Mind if I join you and your friend at your cane and able? Well, sit right down, soldier. What do you have? Gin and bitters, if it's all the same to you, sir. A gin and bitters, please, miss. Yes, sir. Hey, David, I'd like you to meet an old friend of mine, Albert. Albert, this is David. Pleasure's all mine, sir. Hi, Albert. Say, uh, what's this, this, uh, cane and able business? Cane and able? Table. Oh. <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> it's slang, David. Rhyming slang, we call it. Rhyming, eh? Well, give, say something to me. And... Well, he went up the apples and pears, and he sets down his cherry ripe on the cane and able. Says to his cows and kisses, and where me round the houses? Hey, now, wait, wait a minute. Slow down. What in the <laughs> world does that double talk mean? <laughs> it's quite simple, Dave. He went up the apples and pears, the stairs. And he sets down his cherry ripe, pipe. On the cane and able. Don't tell me. Table. Right. <laughs> and says to his cows and kisses. The missus. And where have we round the houses? Trousers! Well, I'll be. Gin and bitters it is, sir. Here you are, miss. Thank you, sir. Here is Tatler's funeral. I'll drink to that. Where have you been, Albert? Why, I haven't seen you for almost... Close to three years now, Polly. Say, Albert, what do those ribbons on your uniform stand for? Oh, them. The girl gave them to me for good behavior. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, come on, seriously. Well, I rather not say if it's all the same oh, to you. Oh, come off it, Albert. Oh, well, that's Dunkirk, and this one's Greece and Crete, and this is North Africa, and this is Italy. Now I suppose they'll be pinning one on me for coming home to England. <laughs> <laughs> say, uh, what's, the, what's the medal for, Albert? That's for the pawn shop after the war. Polly. Oh, uh, that's okay, Dave. I used to think the same as Polly about those things. And what's changed your mind, pray tell? A handful of pretty coloured ribbons. Now you're willing to die for the Empire, eh, Albert? I'm not dying for no Empire, Polly. What's the Empire ever meant to me? I never got none of the benefits out of Africa or India or Egypt or Palestine or Malaya and Hong Kong or Singapore. We here in England pay as much for spices from India and rubber from Malaya as you do in America. Did you know that, Dave? No, I didn't, Albert. It's true. Of course it's true. All right, then. Who is it that benefits from the Empire? I'll tell you. It's the blokes what own the shares in the companies what exploit places like India and South Africa. That's who. And a bloody small percentage of England they are, too. Right you are, Albert. Oh, and I thought you'd gone and changed on me, chum. I have, Polly, I have. How's that? Well, you just finished saying that... I wasn't doing any dying for the Empire, and I'm not going to. What I'm risking my neck for is a better England after the war. A good job, short on hours and long on pay, decent living quarters, a liberal government... Members of Parliament who represent blokes like me and not just the blokes who live in the West End. What's funny about that, Polly? What's funny? What guarantee have you got that you're going to get all of these things after the war? Where's your collateral? Who's co-signing this note for your future? The Angel Gabriel? No. Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin's co-signed my note for me, Polly. That's who. And God blimey, they'd better keep their word or I'll make trouble. <laughs> Years of servitude to war, years taken out of lives, years of meager food, uncertainty, bombings and slaughter, be forgotten. Stop. When rebuild England, intend to rebuild lives and security with it. Stop. Have not forgotten sacrifices and have no intention. Cable from the Globe, old fellow? Well, wouldn't you be? Well, if I were you, I'd stick to the Daily Communique. Find myself a sympathetic lady friend and have myself a good time while I was over here. That sounds as if you don't expect me to be here very much longer. Oh, there's no room in England for idealists. Look, Dickie boy, I'm no idealist. I'm a reporter. I sent the Globe a story telling them what I saw and heard, and then they... Oh, play it safe, old boy. Stick to the Daily Communique. Don't be naive. Don't you know the truth doesn't always look good in print? Wait a minute. Who says I have to print it? If I can't send the truth about the people, why not send the people themselves? Huh? Uh, give it to me slowly. Sure, look, it's the little people of the world who have to fight the wars. 
But if the little people met and knew each other and realized that their common interests were tied up together... There'd never be another war, right? Right. Uh, hold on a minute. Sc scatter a shipload of English workers through a hundred American factories. Let them stay there for the duration. No speeches, no propaganda, no nothing. Just work. How long would it take for the Americans to find out that all Englishmen don't wear monocles and spats? Send some Detroit workers to England, and the English would soon discover that all Americans aren't gigolos. Where are those cable forms? Um, who are you sending a cable to, Sedgwick? The Globe. The biggest story of the day. Uh, what story? Via press wireless by Sidgwick. London plan to bring about closer understanding little people Britain, their opposite numbers America. Today advanced a letter to British Minister Labour. Say, 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 what's this? I just came to the ministry and they didn't say anything about this. He hasn't received the letter yet, stupid. I'm going to write it after I file this cable. <laughs> And this is their reply, Polly. I got it this afternoon. Have filed your tonight's think piece in waste basket. Stop. You not over there to solve England's social problems. Stop. Your copy lately, too full of phrase, quote, little people, unquote. Please abstain using this phrase in future. Oh, you poor darling. Does that air raid siren bother you, Polly? Do you want to go to a shelter? It's funny. You know, the people who run your paper are no different from those I wait on at Claridge's. They all want to maintain the status quo. Polly, I moved out of the Savoy today. Why, David? To be near my new job. New job? Oh, don't tell me they've gone and sacked you. Oh, no, no, Polly. I'm still working for the Globe, but... I've taken another job in a munitions plant. Have you gone bar me, David? Now, what do you want to go and do a thing like that for? Because I believe in people like Albert and you, Polly. I believe in this war. And I want to help our side out. I've written and talked enough about democracy. Now I want to do something for it. And I want you to quit your job and come in this with me. Polly, this is a people's war with all of us fighting for something to believe in. People's war? What kind of people? Oh, Polly. Oh, no. When it ain't no longer a reserved occupation to serve tea and crumpets to swells on the dotted four, and when they give us some guarantees for the future, then I'll join your bloody war. But not until. Uh-oh. That was a close one. You frightened, darling? <laughs> Who, me? Please take shelter of the cellar, everybody. Harry, please. Come on, Polly. Safest place in the Blitz is under a stairway. Ah, here we are. Stand over there. Let me get in front of you, darling. Are you okay? Please turn off that anvil. Oh, you're breaking my head. He's awake. Support his head, nurse. Uh, Mr. Sedgwick, try to drink this, please. Ah, there we are. Feel better now? What... What happened to me? May I, doctor? Yes, certainly. You were in a restaurant in Soho, Sedgwick. You received a direct hit in the raid three days ago. Three days? Where's Polly? Polly? The girl I was with, where is she? What happened to her? Oh, her. Uh, she's okay. As a matter of fact, she's clamoring to get in here right now. Uh, look here, old man. I want to get your story of the raid. What was it like? I've had a dozen cables from home. I want to see that girl. I want... Hello, David. Polly. Oh, very well, Sedgwick. I'll come back later. You may have five minutes with him, miss, and then you'll have to go. Thank you, Doctor. Well? Oh, darling. No, 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 Polly. But supposing something had happened? Funny. I had exact, exactly the same thought about you. Who? Me? Nonsense. It'll take more than a direct hit to put little Polly out of the war. Oh, now tell me, David. What's wrong with you? 
Well, I just woke up five seconds before you came into the room, Polly. I... I haven't had You can a move both of your arms, can't you? Even though they're bandaged up. Well, I... I think so. Uh, how, how about your legs? Are they both okay? I... I Here, don't... I'll pinch them for you. How's that? Right leg okay? Yes. Left leg? Pinch harder, Polly. <laughs> Always joking, ain't you? There. How's that? What's the matter, David? Polly. I didn't feel it. In that case, we'll remove all doubts from the gentleman's mind by drawing... <gasps> Honey. <gasps> Honey, don't cry. Who's crying anyway? Oh, David, I'd love you. I'd love you if you didn't have any legs, David. Thank you, darling, but... <laughs> now what's troubling you? Well, I... I don't know how I'm going to be able to stand in a machine in that factory ten hours a day. Does it... Does it mean so much to you, David? Yes, Polly. It does. Then, all right, don't worry about it. I'll quit Claridge's, David. I'll take your job in the war plant. Polly. Oh, Polly, I'm proud of you. I knew you'd change your mind about the war. I knew it. I haven't changed my mind about the war. You... Look, David, let's be honest with each other. Life is no storybook. I'm going to help out with the thing you want done. But not for none of those high-blown reasons you're always talking about. I'm being honest, David. I ain't no patriot. But I am a woman. And, well, I'm in love with you. That's why I'm doing it. Okay, darling. Have it your way. And another thing. Just because I'm working in a war plant don't mean nothing. I'm going to keep an eye on certain people here in England just the same. And you'll help me, David. Yes, dear. I'll help you. And if they tries to cheat us out of anything we've won in this war, then we'll see if we can arrange another direct hit, especially for their benefit. Tonight, Words at War has brought to you It's Always Tomorrow by Robert St. John. The radio dramatization was by Martin Stern, and the cast included Bill Quinn as Dave Sedgwick, Kathleen Cordell as Polly, John Stanley as Albert, and John Moore as Matthews. The music was arranged and played by William Meter. Production, Garnet Garrison. Next week, Words at War will present the radio dramatization of Borrowed Night by Oscar Ray. This series of programs is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC Network. Mm-hmm.